Hey you all, Carpetbagger here, coming to you live from the south. More specifically, Clinton, Tennessee. And even more specifically than that, I'm at the Museum of Appalachia. Now don't let the name fool you. That sounds like maybe kind of a bland name, but this is actually one of my absolute favorite museums, one of my absolute favorite attractions. There is way more here than you may expect, so way more interesting things. There's a lot of hidden gems here at the Museum of Appalachia, and it's been a few years uh, since I've made my way out here, so I'm excited to check back in and explore the Museum of Appalachia. I think you'll all be very pleasantly surprised, so please follow me. Here is a wood carving of Mark Twain. And uh, interestingly enough, this says that they have the cabin here that Mark Twain was conceived in, not born in, but conceived. That's pretty interesting. Here's the Tom Cassidy house. This is a shack that a local musician by the name of Tom Cassidy lived in during the last stages of his life. You can see some of his music playing there on the radio. Now I have worked in an Appalachian History Museum, not this one, but a different Appalachian History Museum. This is a hog scalding pot where they boil a hog and render all his hair off. Some of my absolute favorite parts of the museum here. This is the Appalachian Hall of Fame. Now as you kind of see, the museum itself is like one big piece of folk art in its own right. Um, it says pictured here are my friends, the warm, happy, independent folk of Southern Appalachia. See the different photos of different people. So this is kind of a Hall of Fame for you know, the common man, the hardworking, independent mountain person. As you can see, the museum has a very homegrown feel to it. The signs are handwritten. You can see here by this clock, this grandfather clock, used to belong to Sam Houston, who, uh, the namesake of Houston, Texas. When you look at these cases, there's just some really amazing things. We have this woman's shoe carved out of coal. It's an interesting little piece. Now this artifact here always uh, really gets me. It says Gold Cooper's knife and Gold Cooper's glass eye. And the story here is when he was six years old he accidentally poked his eye out with that pocket knife. That knife pierced his eye rendering his eye useless. So this is the glass eye that he had to get to replace the eyeball that he poked out. And uh, his daughter donated both artifacts to the museum where they uh, sit next to each other today. His eye and the knife that poked out his real eye. Here are some molds for making counterfeit coins. It says that uh, belonged to a coal miner who injured his leg in a coal mine, I guess, uh, to make ends meet, started making fake money. Looks like this is the precursor to the old uh, commercial where this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, the fried egg. So apparently this used to be displayed where they said this was a, they showed the normal stick, and they said that this was a normal stick that was put in a jar of moonshine, and um, it became all twisted and pretzel-like, so yeah. This is your brain. This is your brain on moonshine. This little wooden cage here would actually be the cage that they would put the canary in in the coal mine to uh, test to make sure the air was safe. It says that this Abraham Lincoln was carved from a buckeye tree by Wimp Gibson. I really like the name Wimp Gibson. 
What better way is there to know a people than to study the everyday things they made, used, mended, and cherished, and cared for with loving hands? You can see that bear skin coat. It's belonged to a trapper. It's a big bear trap there, along with the bear skin gloves. Here's the descendants of George Burkhart. Said he reportedly raised his family in a tree. And there is the tree that uh, George Burkhart lived in. You can see these exhibits on just interesting different mountain people like old Jim Smith, the caveman. It's, uh, there's Jim Smith there that says it's the only picture uh, known to have been taken of Jim Smith who lived in a cave. There's some of his personal items, his old hog trough. It's Alex Stewart, a uh, wood carver. You can see a lot of his unique carvings. Here you have a carving of a bunch of dogs uh, treeing raccoons. It says Jet Mackey lived so far back in the mountains that he likely never saw a ship, so he made a chair in a bottle. So usually people who construct a ship in a bottle, old Jet Mackey, he just made a chair in a bottle. Little wood carved animals and creatures. See a wood carved possum right there. This is one of my favorite items here. They call it the devil. This was a naturally forming uh, piece of chestnut wood found by a man named Casey Jones and um, all he added were these eyes and the eyebrows and then the mouth which are real horse teeth and created this uh, fascinating sculpture of the devil. This teeny tiny shack here is actually a doctor's office. Dr. Andy Osborne's medicine house in Blackwater, Virginia. You can see all the old-timey medicines in there. Operating a Dodger's office out of a shed. Mom, look at that blue guy. Look, I'm doing the exact thing at that blue guy over there. Of course, what would an Appalachian museum be without wonderful quilts? Different names. We have Della McNeil's Friendship Quilt. This quilt's known as The Bachelor's Dream. And for some reason, this is called the murder quilt. See some Appalachian children's toy, including some dolls there. There we have Mac the doll and Topsy Turvy the black or white doll. There's a toy pistol. Back from the days when we didn't care if toy pistols looked just like real pistols. Some uh, mountain folk dolls, little sock monkey there. This here may be one of the most amazing museum items I've ever come across. This is Asa Jackson's fabulous perpetual motion machine. Now, Asa Jackson was a backwoods inventor and he used this machine here to uh, create what no other scientist before or since has been able to create a machine of perpetual motion, a machine that powered itself, just kept moving, you know, was able to maintain movement without any energy added to it. But of course, during the Civil War, Asa became worried when the, the, the Northerners came down. He didn't want the Northerners to be able to um, steal his technology. Apparently he had built this back in a, in a cave um, to kind of keep it a secret and when he when he thought that the Yankees may be coming he disassembled the machine and uh, So that they wouldn't be able to get their hands on the technology now after Asa Jackson died um, You know the machine was still disassembled Family tried to put it back together tried to get the perpetual motion machine back up and running But no one has ever been able to figure out how to get the perpetual motion machine back in operation so some some, some energy saving technology, some, ener some world changing technology is now lost to time. Yeah, saying that he got the machine running, the wheels turning for weeks at a time without any power. Hey, 
heading here into the music section. You can see all these wonderful Appalachian instruments, such as these fiddles right here. You can see these banjos here. Sometimes banjos were made from uh, interesting items. There's a ham can banjo, or a ham joe, if you will. Over here we have a hubcap banjo. There's a groundhog hide, I guess they'll be used to skin banjos with. Here's Raymond Fairchild's jawbone fiddle. Looks like it'll be a fiddle made out of the jawbone of a horse. You can see the fiddle there on the top. And he had a, a lot of his friends sign it. Their signatures from Bill Monroe and Ralph Stanley on there. Here's Cass Walker. He was the grocery store magnate that actually um, discovered Dolly Parton. There's a couple of his hats. And there's a wood-carved bust of Cass Walker. One of the biggest names in bluegrass music, Bill Monroe, I think. And in fact, he actually named the style of music bluegrass. And uh, there's his hat right there. There's Grandpa Jones from the show Hee Haw. We have Grandpa Jones's shotgun. Exhibit on the famed Carter family. One of the biggest families in uh, mountain music. There's Mother Maybelle Carter's meal and flower chest. This shows how important the Carter family was to uh, mountain people. There's actually a picture of the Carter family glued inside of a Bible. Because that's how important they were. Some mountain guitars. This is, that's Ray King's Elvis Presley guitar. Here's some mandolins, the instrument that I very briefly attempted to learn how to play. There is a bedpan banjo, where it says right there on the sign, the uke a wee wee Another uh, bathroom-based instrument, the um, commode seat guitar. You can see that banjo up there is made out of an old cookie tin. So this is the murder bench. Apparently there was a family feud uh, it seems similar to the Hatfield-McCoy feud, said a war was started when someone's hog ate the mash out of someone's whiskey still, causing the families to begin feuding and people ended up dying. It says one of the victims was shot and brought into a church and set on this bench and his blood soaked the bench so bad that uh, the people were disturbed going into church every Sunday and singing bloody bench so they uh, they eventually put it outside and it says they tried to burn the blood stain off and it says you can see the burn marks from yeah where they tried to burn off the blood stain right there it says this buggy here belonged to Uncle Doctor Ira Carter so our body aids for walking and working uh, these people are injured. These are things that would help them carry on. We see some crutches and canes. There's a uh, a hook, a hand replacement. Very crude, uh, man, very crude uh, replacement for a hand. Um, there's a artificial hand replacement that actually has a spoon on it so someone could eat soup. This is an angel crown. Apparently it is a phenomenon where they find these uh, swirls of feathers inside the pillows of dead children. They used to have a larger collection of angel crowns hanging right there. I don't know what happened to them, but they do still have the one angel crown right there. There's an old metal casket. They place a dead body and even have a little peephole so you could see the person's face and then until you were done seeing their face and then you could put this lid right there and completely cover them up. It's an unused baby casket that also has a peephole. There's a 
their little casket. This chest here was originally meant to be a child's coffin, um, but they ended up not using it, and so they turned it into a tool chest. Some funerary items. So there's a big jug of embalming fluid there, and then these are, I guess, makeup and other things to uh, prepare the body with. Yeah, they do have quite a collection of old child coffins. So there's a coffin in the back of this wagon here. Here we have some wonderful folk art, some carvings. I do like this one a lot. The Thing. Kind of reminds me of that uh, devil that we saw earlier. Some interesting handmade dolls. In this case, a wooden pistol right there, and then some dolls of corpses in caskets. This here is a self-portrait of Minnie Black, known as the Gourd Lady. And that thing there, that, that's just a touch creepy. It's a carving of Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. There's a floor mat made entirely out of cigarette packs. We have up here an Indian and a white man. That's what the sign says. It's a carving of a family Bible reading by a James Bunch. Um, really like the interesting uh, carvings of the, of the characters there. It's another James Bunch work. Preacher John, the Preacher Man. That's a wooden knife, a wooden pocket knife. Interestingly enough, the carved wooden knife there is modeled after the real knife that it was carved with. There's a wooden puzzle that has a pair of wooden knuckles. There's a license plate that says Dayton, Monkey Town. Of course, a reference to Dayton, Tennessee, where the Scopes Monkey Trial took place. Some other random things. There's a Mastodon vertebrae in that frame. <coughs> Says this hundred year old stone bell adorned the top of the Southern Bell Telephone Building in Knoxville, Tennessee. And right now, adorning the top of this uh, stone bell is a peacock. Hey there. Here are two genuine 1874 jail cells. It says they're designed for four inmates each. Let's peek inside. They're not exactly what you would call roomy. Oh yeah, you can see the beds, how close they were to each other. Not a lot of other facilities in there besides the bed. All right, and from the Appalachian Hall of Fame, we now head into the display barn. This building has a lot of old farming tools. You can see the axes up there, a lot of different axes. You can see all those old leather shoes and the shoemaker hard at work. The sign there says, this hornet's nest given to me by my cousin Horny Rogers. He said, here's a hornet's nest made by hornets on Horny's Hornet Farm at Sharps Chapel. In your classic Appalachian Museum artifact, pieces of a moonshine still. Got a full still display up there. This chair belonged to a lifelong bachelor, Roe Martin. He built the chair extra big so that all women visitors could sit in the chair with him. And it says on the sign, it says in the 80s, he sold me this chair because he was getting too damn old to be interested. Some various police tools. We have a ball and chain, some leg irons, and then some good old billy clubs meant for uh, beating prisoners. These are fish gigs, I guess, meant for spearing fish. And there's a fish, maybe one that you would uh, stick a spear in. 
We have a gray fox there. Some mouse traps. That looks like maybe an albino groundhog. There's some hides up there. We have a coon hide stretched out. A poor old possum hide. That's another coon hide. And this is probably the most horse bits I've ever seen in my entire life. This is an exhibit on Cedar Creek Charlie. He uh, lived alone and painted everything in a unique pattern. His entire house painted in this unique red, white, and blue polka dot pattern. All his furniture, his walls. You can see that. He's truly lived in a folk art environment. You can see over here that uh, his clothing would be painted to match with that uh, speckled motif. All these items are made by folk artist Doe Pug. These are all items made by the Gourd Lady, Minnie Black, we actually saw her self-portrait um, in the other building. But uh, yeah, look at all these interesting sculptures that she made from gourds. And yeah, check out these gourd people up here. Love the gourd people. Now this exhibit that's coming up in the People's Building is uh, extremely important to me. Now we're about to take a look at an exhibit on Harrison Mays. He made these crosses and hearts and um, planted them all across the highways of the south, some in the north. Um, I have found where they are still planted um, and probably about probably about at least half a dozen I've found out in the wilds. So I've actually become pretty obsessed with locating the remaining hearts and crosses of Harrison Mays. He was a traveling preacher. He would travel. He would just put these in, in on the side of the road on the old highways. Didn't ask permission. Just planted them. Um, actually, his house is in Middlesbrough, Kentucky. It is shaped like a cross. I uh, think I did a video out there. But uh, yeah, love the story of Harrison Mays. Love the the idea of the traveling, uh, the traveler going out and planting these messages, and the fact that they're still out there and still out there to be found. You can see the hearts here that he made. That's right here. It says, "God help me get these sacred signs in 50 states, 82 nations, seven seas, and all the big rivers and lakes on earth." one of the crosses right here and when he died he left uh, instructions on where he wanted the the uh, crosses planted after his death it says erect this sign in Italy in the 1990s add some very interesting ideas too on where he thought the signs could be planted you can see the instructions there to be erected on planet Jupiter in the 1990s oh yeah and remember if you go to hell it's your fault there's a mold that he would use to, to shape the crosses back there, a wood mold. See some of his signs planted along here, side of the building. Yeah, here's his home where he made his crosses. This home is in Middlesboro, Kentucky. It is still shaped like a cross, although you can't really see it very well from the street. Because, you know, straight on, it just kind of looks like a normal house, but it's clearly shaped like a cross from above. This box was attached to the front of his house. It says, notice, open to God your heart and say, Jesus, save me. In addition to making the concrete crosses and hearts, he would actually put messages in bottles, religious messages in bottles, and toss them into rivers. It's a collection he had uh, to showcase things of the devil. And uh, what do we have here? There's 
cigarettes, brass knuckles, birth control pills. I think there's some prescription pills in there. There's a little uh, metal devil himself. And some liquor bottles in the back. There's his shoes right there. And um, I love this. His bike that he rode around I actually did not have a driver's license. Um, he'd have to borrow uh, a friend and a truck to go plant the, the crosses, but he would travel around on this bike. And it says, this bike is dedicated to outer space. Hope to ride it on the moon and many of the planets erecting sacred signs. There's his jacket. You can see he had drawn crosses all over his jacket. I believe the idea is that there's a cross for each uh, denomination of the Christian church. Love how he did this. He had these maps uh, documented his travels. This is just the 1960s. You can see he mapped out uh, the road trips he went on planting signs. I bet if I mapped out my road trips, they'd look similar to that. There's an exhibit on James Bunch. I think we saw some of his carvings earlier. What's really impressive in here is he carved a full-size motorcycle out of wood. So interesting little article off the side here. The story of Uncle, Fe Uncle Felix Bush Breezel, the man who attended his own funeral says 8,000 to 12,000 people came to his funeral, uh, but he was still alive. He was really curious about um, what, uh, what people would say about him during his funeral. He used to have his hat right there. I don't know where that went. Now a large portion of the museum is actually this outdoor farm area where they have a bunch of old buildings and animals. Now this is actually the Mark Twain cabin. Uh, where Mark Twain was conceived, where his parents, um, you know, begun the process of bringing him into the world. It does look like they're doing some uh, renovations on it, though, so we can't go inside. Looks like an old snake oil salesman. Doc Randall's old medicine show, Pills, Tonic, and Music. Hey, Mr. Goat, what are you doing? This is the Big Tater Valley Schoolhouse. There's a bee tree, uh, we won't get too close to that. So I appreciate you guys joining me here today at the Museum of Appalachia. And once again, this is one of my favorite places to visit. It's such a unique museum, such a unique experience. And I wanna let you know that, that every time I come here, I notice something different. There's so many little things, so many little interesting things in the museum. Um, I always see something new, always learn something new, which I think is a sign of a, of a good museum. So I cannot recommend this more. I, I, I I should have put this in my top 10 list because this is one of my favorite experiences. If you'd like to see other places I've been, uh, please check the interactive map in the description of this video. If you'd like to help support the channel, uh, consider donating to Patreon. Uh, $3 or more will get you a postcard once a month. There's other options as well. All that's in the description. Until next time, this one's in the bag.